metal is still in your body. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's better. We have no jokes today. Uh, Tim has been stricken with the COVID thing, so he's, he's down for this week. His wife had it last week, and he caught it from her. I don't understand how. <laughs> but uh, so you're stuck with me this morning. We have lots of announcements. Coming up just a couple weeks, the 29th, we're all going to gather over at Carol Anderson and Dave Anderson's home. And that is on Dorchester. We might be doing that twice because the leaves haven't fallen yet. And by the 29th, they will be. Hopefully. Um, Dorchester is off Hendrick. If you take Henry Street south to Hendrick, turn right, go west. The first street to the right, going north, is Dorchester. Go to where the turn is, and that's where their house is. Red house. It's a red house. And Do you we're not gonna have an address, Carol. <laughs> what? I asked, I asked Izzy, she did not have an address. I, I don't know what it is. I just know where she lives. 4907. 4907, okay. On the 6th. That's uh, just two weeks from today, three weeks from today, 23rd, 30th, and then the 6th. We will be having and hosting another Friends and Family Day. We want you all here. Uh, it's, it's hard to disseminate the families, but in one of the families, whoever has the most representatives from their immediate family, there will be a prize. And following that, and of course during that service, Team Challenge will be here. They will be singing up here, giving testimonies. Uh, you'll enjoy the service that day on uh, the 6th. Uh, it's a potluck. Bring a dessert to share, it says. And of course, food for the food drive. We'd like to send a whole truckload of food home with the uh, Team Challenge out on Honolulu Road. So bring, bring uh, non-perishable uh, foods. But for the day, bring perishable food, good, sweet stuff <laughs> for the desserts. And then uh, that, that's going to be a fun day. We'll, we'll have a great day here. Uh, the 18th of November is Alex Soat. 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 I think that's what I said. Uh, you don't want to miss that concert, guys. It, it, many of you have missed, and the next Sunday you come and everybody's raving about the concert. Uh, we'd like to pack this place out for, for that concert on the 18th. That is a Friday, and it begins at 7. Uh, so put that on your calendar. And we are having a Thanksgiving Eve service this year. Some of you will be asked to give a testimony of praise as to what's gone on in the last year for you, how has God blessed you, or challenged you. And uh, we'll be having, there'll be a lot of music, and of course, desserts. It says, it says Thanksgiving Eve service with donuts and ciders. That's it? That's it? <laughs> uh, angry orchards and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, no, none of that. Uh, lots of ciders, okay. All right, uh, we're looking forward to a great service this morning. Lots of children. It's good to see you here today. We have quite a few people sick and missing from our group, but pray for them. Some are traveling, some are sick. Uh, Linda told me this morning Travis has gone to uh, urgent care or something for something and uh, not feeling good. And so let's pray together for them. Thanks again for being here. We're looking forward to a great time this morning. Walk across the aisle, greet one another in the name of the Lord, and uh, tell them you love them. And if you don't love them, tell them you pray for them. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I know, but well, I'm going to be here. Sorry, my shift changed.
time to save that one lost lamb. To only the king wore that crown of thorns so I could wear.
she's really struggling. It's almost like she's given up. Is that right, Penny? Yeah. So let's pray for Sherry. And, uh, our hearts just go out to her. Are there other requests that we do not know about? Everybody's good, huh? Okay. Oh. Hey, Joyce? prayed last week for her surgery. And, uh, I saw her just before the surgery. She was in pretty good spirits. But not so much now. <laughs> Cindy? Um, a friend of mine, Narsha, is um, scheduled to have ovarian cancer surgery on November 1st. She's going to the Mayo Clinic, so if we can keep her in our prayers. Okay, we will. Darsha? See, there are things to pray for, including the people. There are some folks in here that are really struggling. Uh, money, inflation hits us all. Jobs. Uh, there are others that are here with heartfelt issues, trouble at home. We know that. We just pray. We're going to pray for, for them. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. You told us to come to you with our request. You also told us if we come, you hear. And we have the things we desired of you in accordance with your will. We asked for Joyce with her eyes that they would heal properly and quickly. And that the cataracts and everything else that goes with it would not only be removed, but her vision would be clear. Lord, we thank you that Tony came through her surgery and we ask that you would touch her body, cause it to heal quickly, completely, and that the pain would be gone from her feet. Pray that you would bless her today and encourage her heart. For Sandy's friend Darsha, Lord, uh, ovarian cancer, we hear about it and we're concerned. We pray that you would lay your hand upon her and upon her physicians and doctors as they diagnose the proper treatments, surgeries, remedies, rehab, all that goes with it, that she would win this battle, that you would strengthen her. We pray for our folks, each member, those who come and claim this as their church, we ask that you would meet in our hearts the needs that are represented, that we wouldn't speak to you or anyone else. Father, I thank and I pray that you would just, uh, whatever those needs are, whether it's family, health, <coughs> those struggling with the after effects of the flu or COVID, or cancer recovery, those who are struggling with family issues, children, and grandchildren, and husbands and wives, we just pray for your perfect will and direction and strength face each day as you bring it to us. Think of those on our list, list of Jake goes for surgery on his feet, or that you would strengthen him and that the surgeons would actually get to the root of the problem, that he would be healed. Lord, for every family, we ask your blessing that our families would exemplify your relationship to your bride. We would love that which is lovely, learn to hate that which is wicked, and serve he who alone is worthy of our worship. We ask your blessing on this service, all that's said and done in it. In 
In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's see. I closed the bulletin to get to the prayer request. Diane, would you come? Oh, we have scripture reading. I'm sorry. Helen, would you come and read scripture for us? reading Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 through 14. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength, and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all that is in them, singing, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. The song I'm going to be singing this morning is Jesus Loves Me. I'm singing along with the accompaniment of Alex Zolt. And if you know, he's quite an... He's very... I, passionate, that's a good word. Passionate. And so I just want to thank him for letting me sing this along with him. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he loves me he who
music for the special, special. Boys and girls can head on down. The rest of us stand and sing, come, Christians join to sing. I don't think I know this song, Carol. Chapter 
5, but I want you to start first in chapter 4, and we have some uh, things that are hard to understand. And the first thing, it says there, the first thing that is in chapter 4, verse 1, and we talked about this last week, he heard a loud voice saying, come up here. John was on the Isle of Patmos, and he, God said, I'm going to give you some revelation. Now I want you to come right up here. And he says, in the Spirit, he went into heaven. Now that's an important phrase, in the Spirit, because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So he changed for a moment, and he was in the Spirit of God, and God began to speak to him. And he says, I'm going to show you what must take place after the church. What is? So we've gone from chapter 3, which ended the seven churches, and, and I believe, if you remember, that uh, the seven churches were obviously chronological, uh, starting with Ephesus, ending with Laodicea, but they also are concurrent. All of these seven churches were in existence at the same time. So a scholar who sees tells you that first we have Ephesus, everybody had the first love, and then we graduated to, to Sardis, and then we did this and uh, up the line. All of the attributes or characteristics of the church of God were present then and are present, present today. Well, finally, the times of the Gentiles, and that was on one of the charts we did some time ago, but the times of the Gentiles comes to an end, and it comes to an end with what we call the rapture, or better, the translation. Jesus comes to take us to heaven. Those who have died before us rise first, they get their new bodies, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and our bodies are changed from a physical to a spiritual, but very, yet very real body. You will look like you, only better. You'll be perfect. I'll look like me. I don't know how it gets better. But. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, we, we, we won't have the aches and pains, the arthritis, the broken bones, the joints, all that. That's all past. And there'll be no sorrow. That's happened. And so now, the Apostle John, he, he's up in heaven, and he was in the Spirit, verse 2, and he says, there was someone uh, before me, and, and there before me was the throne. The first thing John saw was the throne. God himself, God Almighty, sitting on the throne. I think we can understand that. And there was someone sitting on it. And this one sat there, had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Doesn't mean much to us. But, Jasper and Cornelian, if you remember the high priest, the high priest of the Jewish faith in that day, wore special clothes. They're designed and in, in showed to us in the book of Leviticus, the law, and on the front was a breastplate and reading right to left. Three in a row, four rows, twelve tribes. Jasper was the first, first stone, and Carnelian was the last. So they went across and they, they listed all the stones. But he, he sat there, he had those, and he had the a rainbow uh, assembling an emerald encircle the throne, and then we get to some symbolism. Surrounding this throne are 24 elders. Now, uh, whoops, I hate it. 24 elders. And uh, people have said, who are those elders? Well, some say, well, it's the 12 apostles. Unfortunately, there are 14. And four, 14 apostles. Well, what do you mean? Well, the apostle Paul was added, Matthias was added, and the apostle Paul was added. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. So we have 14. That doesn't fit. There were 12 tribes of Israel. Heads of the home. There's Jacob's sons. Judah. And, and, uh, 
the whole list of the twelve. Who are they? They are probably, scripture doesn't tell us, but they are probably representatives of both the church and believing Israel. Heroes of the faith. And this is important to remember. People of faith, and if you want to read the cavalcade of, of, of faith winners, you might go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and you could open up and it tells us. How about Daniel? Daniel in the lion's den. Don't like Daniel in the lion's den. How about the four guys, that uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? My preacher used to say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But <laughs> they were thrown into the fiery furnace. You'd think they'd be represented, wouldn't you? How about Moses? How about the prophet Isaiah? Tells us more about heaven. Did you know the prophet Isaiah tells us more about heaven than any of the New Testament books except for Revelation? It's a wonderful book. He certainly would be one of them. We don't know who they were. A scripture, an apologist, or somebody who tells you that he knows, he doesn't know any more than you do. But we do know that they were men who loved God. Or women. There may be. You know, there were women judges. There were women prophets. There were women preachers. Lydia, a wonderful saint who helped found the church in the early church. Apostle Paul found her. We don't know who these people were, so it, it doesn't make any difference. There, there's some, something significant about them. Then he goes on, surrounding the throne were the 24 elders, and seated on them were 24 elders, and they, th those are literal. There's nothing symbolic about it, except he doesn't tell us who they are. They were dressed in white and had crowns on gold on their heads, and, uh, and from the throne... It's where God is, the first person we see when we get to glory. Came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, seven lamps were blazing. And then he tells you who the seven lamps are. These are the seven spirits of God. Now you want to know the spirits of God, you have to search scripture. Isaiah chapter 11 will tell you what the spirits are. And the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, and there's a whole, whole, whole list of definitions there. And we we'll, won't go into that today. But also before the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. We have an advantage here. When, when we moved here from the southeastern part of the state, it seems like in our family, we spent inordinate amounts of time driving down to the ovals, Sea Lake, Michigan. We'd go past the water treatment plant down there and the waves crashing over. Remember, my father-in-law would pull right up to the edge. That's when the water was high. It'd splash over his great big Buick Electra 220, 225. And, and, and he, he thought that was so cool until he got home and the sand came up with it and his car was filthy. And, but you've been down to the lake when it's just clear, flat as a pancake, glorious. The, the light shines off it. And I think sometimes we get more sunburn from the lake than we do from the sun above. It's the reflections. It's a glorious place. Seven spirits of God, they were on there, and, and that just tells us that the seated one seated on the throne was, was God. And then in the center around the throne, so we got 24 around, each seated with crowns on their heads, conquerors, and then you get down, he says, in the center around the throne were four living creatures. Who are the four living creatures? Well, each one of them says they looked like. So you look in, in verse, in verse uh, 6 and 7. In the center around the four living creatures, and they were covered. They had eyes everywhere. Ooh, that's weird. In front and in back. I know that many times I thought my mother had eyes in the back of her head. Most kids do. Because they can see everything or feel like the, we feel like it. But the first living creature was like a lion. It wasn't a lion. But 
that features like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. It wasn't an ox, but it had features that would resemble an ox. And a third had a face like a man. That takes it out of the realm saying, well, it wasn't a man, but it looked like a man. And so you, each time we have to understand, what is God trying to say here? The fourth was like a flying eagle. It wasn't an eagle, but it looked and had attributes that would lend itself to that. Now here's what I believe, and, and you, you can take it for what it's worth, because uh, a lot of this stuff is just the result of study. You don't have to believe it, but I do believe this. The Gospels begin with the book of Matthew. And how did Je was Jesus presented in Matthew? Well, he was presented as the king. King of the Jews. Now this isn't Jesus sitting here. It's a four living creature. I think it refers to the way Christ was re presented to the world. A living creature representing the king. What's the king of king of beasts? It's the lion. Had features like that. He, with great authority and, and, and great uh, power. It, it, and it, it exhibited those. The second one takes you to the Gospel of Mark. In Mark, it's a unique book because it presents Jesus as a servant. The ox in that era was the beast of labor. They re everything depended on the ox, from the tilling of the land to the harvesting the crop. After you harvested, it was the ox that was on the, 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 grind, the grain grinder that would roll around. So the ox was a servant, the beast of burden. Jesus is presented as a servant in Mark. The third... The third had a face like a man, and that would bring you to the Gospel of Luke. Well, how was Jesus presented in Luke? He was the Son of Man. Oh, he was the Son of God, too. But he, his, the attributes of the man, Jesus. That's why you have a, have a lineage, or, a, or the genealogy of Christ in Matthew, to prove that he was of the tribe of Judah and could be and was the appointed Messiah and King of the Jews. But in Luke we have a genealogy which is to prove that he was really man. He took upon himself the form of a servant, the ox, and was found made in the fashion of a man. That's how Jesus is presented there. And finally you get to the fourth like a flying eagle the four living creatures with the six wings and the eyes all over, the, the eagle is the Gospel of John. And how does John present Jesus? He is the Son of God. God Almighty. I don't know if there are founding fathers uh, studied scripture. I don't know if they, but they understood the eagle, our symbol. Is a power uh, is, is a picture of a belief and presentation of God in all its power. Now you can take that. That's how I interpret it. I think it makes sense and it's consistent with Scripture. But the thing that I wanted you to see about this is that the around the throne, the elders, whomever they are, twelve apostles, twelve of the tri tribes of Israel. Representatives of all nations. I think in, in our era, I think I'd put Billy Graham as one of those, wouldn't you? Greatest evangelist. D.L. Moody from here. The Wesley brothers in Europe founded the founders of the Methodist Church, which at one time was one of the greatest and most powerful gospel preaching denominations in the world. Martin Luther, bringer of the Reformation. You think might, he might be there? The point I want to make is that these are godly, wonderful people. Righteous and holy, full of faith. Any of the, You could go to that Hebrews 11 passage and see the heroes of the faith. It lists them and tell, it tells you what they did. These are good people.
and they went through this list. And they got to chapter 5. They saw on the right hand of him that who sat on the throne, that would be God. They saw him holding a scroll in his right hand. And the angel that was talking and giving inspiration to, for John to get the who is, who, who was, who is, and who, who the future said, said, we have to have somebody open the book. And nobody could. Wouldn't you think Martin Luther could open the scroll? Don't you think that Daniel could open the scroll who prophesied much of what we're going to talk about in the next next several weeks? Don't you think he could open the scroll? Don't you think Billy Graham would be worthy to open the scroll? They could look, and here we had the 24 elders, the four living uh, creatures in front of the throne and around the throne, Jesus who takes it from, the, from, from his right hand, and there was no one. I would think these guys would be worthy, wouldn't you? And look how they sang at the end of the chapter, of chapter 4. Holy, holy, holy. This morning, we sang. You know, we, we, we only have record of angels singing once in Scripture. When they're in the heaven proclaiming the birth of Christ, they shouted. They didn't sing. The word Alleluia, Hallelujah, to us, is only used twice in the whole Bible. How did they worship? They fell down and worshiped. Because they saw really the holiness of God. I, I, I hate to say this. I, I I love singing. I love singing here. You sing very well when we know what we're singing. I go to other churches and they have a band and and and, and the, the drums and the sound and it's magnificent. It's good music. I don't think it can compare. It's not worship because worship is about God. And when they went to worship. They didn't see anything about us. They saw God in all of his holiness. And so they looked and they looked. In verse 4 of chapter 5 it says, I wept and because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And, and here, <clears throat> have you ever longed and say, oh Lord, I wish I could understand you. I want to know you better. Please show me something. Uh, I, I want to know what I believe is real. And, and you wonder and wonder. And it, 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 this was so dear. He said he wept and he wept and he wept. And uh, then one of the elders, one of the 24, came to him and said, Hey, don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll. So who actually opened the scroll that we are about to read and we're about to study? It was Jesus, who alone is worthy to handle his word. It was sealed seven times. Now, like, uh, unlike us, we read left to right. The scrolls was open from right to left. They read right to left. We read left to read. It doesn't make us right or wrong. How, how else could you read English? I don't know. Uh, but he said, said I'm going to. And then it says, see the line of tribe in verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Well, he had been slain. But he conquered death and hell. And he said, he alone. And I want you to see his worship. Everybody fell on their face. We have no record that they jumped around and waved their hands in the air. It's okay if you want to do that. I don't care. But it's not about us. 
it's discouraging uh, when I see people more concerned about the presentation than the presenter. When we take we take more time to worry about the cre creator creation than we do the creator. The green movement in our country, world, oh, we're all going to die if we just looked at the creator and didn't worry about the creation. All worship one. And who did they worship? The lamb who had the power to open the Folks, my, my premise for this whole message is that we all, there is only one that we worship. And if we are more concerned with the loudness or the softness, <coughs> the atmosphere, if you must whisper, whisper a prayer in church. Uh, come on. You've, anybody ever hear that? Carol, you did. I know you heard that. Uh, where did that come from? They all worshipped. Now, my point is this. If the apostles weren't worthy of opening the book, if the Old Testament saints, many of whom probably authored the, the Old Testament, if they were not worthy, who is worthy? It's only Jesus. Worship. Why? Because we can't help ourselves. Now I want to ask each of you to examine our hearts. Why do we worship our God? Because if we don't worship Him, who are we worshiping? Our talent? Our ability? The loudness or the softness? The mood of our emotions or the mood, who, who do we actually worship? And it comes down, most of us are pretty narcissistic and we worship us. See, everybody has a theology. The agnostic, he says, ah, I don't know if there's God, don't, know, don't care, one way or the other. The atheist says there is no God. The theist says there is one God. The multi-theist says there are many gods. But everybody's got one. And usually it's us. We think we know better. And when we worship ourselves, we become our own God. And we don't bow down. We don't worship because we don't recognize the holiness of God. You notice how they worship? Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And we get to chapter 5 and they find out the reason that he's worthy is found in verse 9. They sang a new song. Here's where, the, where we get worship and why we say the preliminary to our service is worship. It's because they sang a new song. I wonder if they knew the words. They did. You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, and because you were slain, your blood, with your blood you purchased men for God. From every tribe and language, and every people and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. We don't worship him because he was slain. We worship him because he was slain to pay for our sin. He was killed for us. And most of us, including me, do not recognize, dear friends, do not recognize how filthy we are in comparison to the holiness of God. If Daniel and his cohorts, if it was the Old Testament saints, if it's the, the apostles and the followers of the church, who you would think somebody in that group, but they all, without exception, recognized their unworthiness.
righteousness. We don't think we are all that bad. Most of us don't. We're pretty good. We, we you know, don't beat my wife, pay the bills, go to work every day, uh, have good kids, well, some of them. Uh, uh, we really think we're okay. After all, I work hard, and I give to charities. I give blood at the blood drives. I, I, I do everything we're supposed to. We think we're all good. But I think very few of us, including myself, don't recognize how holy our God is. But we will. When those of us who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, cleansed free. There's no condemnation. Get actually into the heavenly places and oh my Lord, and I honestly believe we'll be on our face. Just like these who sat before the Lord and said, oh, your righteousness is beyond description. Your holiness is beyond measure. The thrill of worshiping an almighty God. Folks, it's important that we remember who we're worshiping. Why? Because he told us to. I think that's the last. That's the last. I want us today to recognize how wretched we are in spite of the fact of being born again, saved by the blood, washed in the blood, and cleansed by his word. How unholy we really are. And the reason they fell down and worshipped is because they recognized their unworthiness and his perfection. Folks, worthy of worship is our Savior alone, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God Almighty in the flesh for us. Worship our Lord. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. That's all we can say. Thank you. Recognizing that you alone are worthy of our time, our effort, our money, our praise. Dear God, you alone are let us worship you, who up was, and is, and is to come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Stand and sing with me, he is Lord. Christ, be with your hearts and minds now and forever. In Jesus' name.